As you know, we have been going through a sermon series uh, that has largely been in the Psalms. Next week, we're going to uh, deviate a bit from the Psalms, Uh, but it'll still be a piece of music in Scripture. And we've been talking about real life, talking about what real life is like. What is it? How do we get through the stuff that's so challenging, the, the things that we're going through in life? And one of the things that is, is necessary, I think, for us to try and make it through the world that we live in is we seek to look at other people, right? Like, what is, how are you handling this? Like, how are you dealing with that? I'm really stressed out. Or, or how are you making friends? Oh, that's what you do. That's how you make friends. If you're a kid or if you're in high school or college or even as an adult, you're like, oh, we need to make more friends. What are things we should do? What are my friends doing to do that? Or I want to I wanna get promoted. I want to I grow on my job. And you look around and you're like, well, well, maybe I should seek some advice from people that have been there. And, and, and I'll compare my track to their track. We have this tendency towards comparison. I was listening to uh, a baseball game uh, the other day. It was a Cubs game, I think. And the announcers were, uh, were talking about, I'm not sure why they were talking about this, but they were talking about, like, what does it mean to be normal? It was one of those weird, weird like, booth moments where like everybody was being super real and it was very uncomfortable for everyone listening. (laughs) And they were talking about what it means to be normal and somebody looked up like it means conforming to a norm. But even the idea of being normal is an act of comparison, right? Like there's a range of dress that you can wear coming to Park City's Baptist Church. If you come in here wearing, I don't know, coat and tails, it's going to raise some eyebrows. You know what? To be fair, it probably wouldn't raise as many eyebrows as you think. <laughs> this is the Park Cities, right? On the other hand, like if you come in here and you're like barefoot and wearing like, I don't know, like Johnny Appleseed pot on your head, right? Like that's going to raise some eyebrows. But there's a, there's a norm, right? It's an act of comparison. You look around and you're like, oh, like not everybody's wearing a jacket. I could probably take my jacket off or, or something like that. We are people of comparison. And sometimes that's okay. Sometimes that helps us. But a lot of the times it does some really sinister things to us. And it does some sinister things to our faith. And frankly, I get really exhausted uh, comparing myself uh, to other people. And so we're in Psalm chapter 73, the 73rd Psalm. And we're going to look at three things that comparison does or can do in our lives. And the first one is that comparison has a tendency to exaggerate things. Comparison exaggerates. Look at verse 1 of chapter 73. This is a psalm of a guy named Asaph, and he says, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. He starts off really great. Sounds good. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. That's that's an indication of wealth and prosperity. They're not in trouble as other people are. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in wickedness. They increase in riches, excuse me. So Asaph, Asaph is a guy, I think, as I'm reading this, probably later on in life, He's aged, he's looking back on his life, and his job, his role in life has been as a, essentially like a, a music librarian in the house of God, and he's appointed there by David. And so he's probably a worship leader, a musician, and then like keeping track of all the songs that they sing in worship. And he's a godly guy, he's probably been a follower of God his whole life, but then he starts to look around. And he's like, you know, the people that don't seem to have any issues seem to be kind of wicked. They seem to not be as faithful as me. They seem to be doing okay. In fact, they seem to be doing more than okay. They seem to be doing better than me. 
And what happens is he makes this statement of faith in verse one. Truly God is good to Israel and he's good to people who are pure in heart. That is a statement of knowledge. He's like, this is what I know I'm supposed to believe. This is what the creed is. This is, this is the correct answer. But the next 11 verses is Asaph being like, but this is how I feel. And this is how things seem. And this is what reality really is right now. And it's a question of fairness. Is it fair that you can live your entire life following God and wind up worse off in life than the people who don't give God a second thought? Is that fair? Asaph seems to think, no, it's not. And what happens is he winds up exaggerating the success, the power, the wealth, the influence, the invulnerability of these people. Look what he says in verse four. He says they don't have any physical or emotional pain. They're completely healthy all the time. In verse five, they're not seemingly afflicted by the randomness of life. You never hear about them getting cancer. You never hear about family members getting cancer. They're just doing great. In verse six, they flaunt their superiority and their abuse of other people without any kind of fear of consequence. They don't have to worry about the law coming. They're so powerful that they can just get away with whatever they want to get away with. In verse 7, they just have large amounts of fun. Everything's great. Everything's a party. They're always attending weddings. They never seem to attend a funeral. Verses 8 to 11, it seems like they have influence that's just everywhere. All the people follow them. All the people go along with them and don't seem to challenge them at all. And in verse 12, a summary statement is made. They have an easy life. They always have enough. They go from having enough to having more than enough. This is really just a question of perspective. You know, when you look up at something, it seems taller than it really is. I'm on a stage right now. You're looking up at me. Probably seem taller. I hope so. But I'm an average height person. You stand at the foot of a skyscraper and you look up. I think it seems massive, and it is. But it seems even more massive when you're standing there, when you don't have any kind of perspective, when you don't see it amongst the other buildings, when you don't have it in like a diagram sitting next to like Mount Everest, when you're not comparing it to the sun. It seems huge. It's all this matter of perspective. When you were a kid, you're real small. Your parents seem gigantic. And then you realize your mom's only 5'2". You're like, she's, but she still scares me, you know? When you, you ever go back as, a, as an adult to your elementary school, you like wander around, you're like, this place is so tiny. Look how little it is. Look at the little toilets. Everything's, but I thought it was so big. You know? It's one of perspective. And that's what comparison does. Comparison tends to exaggerate. When you don't have the right perspective, it tends to exaggerate the, the, the things that other people have. It makes them grander and bigger and, and more impervious to, to pain and suffering. The influence that they have seems to be never ending, right? You're like, oh, they have so many followers and, 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 and all this is happening and they don't have a right thought in their head, but man, oh man, they have a lot of people listening to them. And this is how we think the world is for people who hold power. People hold wealth and influence and, and all that stuff. That's what we think. We exaggerate it, just like Asaph does. They don't think they don't have any problems, right? We all have people in our lives that we think never, they, they have the Midas touch, right? Everything just kind of works out. Or we have people that you could point to in the news and you're like, well, there they go, getting away with it again. Like, they're not even gonna do jail time. Maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe, you know what? Maybe you are somebody like that. Where everything just kind of works out. Never had a hard day. Or your hard day is, is like a, a Tuesday for somebody else. Or maybe you've been a victim of somebody who just has gotten away with things that they never should have gotten away with. And you're like, what's the point of speaking out? They're just going to get away with it again. Inversely, what this exaggeration does to us it's not just our perspective of other people that gets shaped. It exaggerates our own righteousness. Because what we tend to think is that, oh, they don't deserve the things that they get. 
And by implication, it's not too much of a leap to then move to, but I'd do pretty good with it. I'd do a better job. If I had billions, I would do so much better things. I was telling my wife yesterday, I was watching a baseball game, and uh, have you ever seen this in, in, in sports where they'll like shrink the size of the game you're watching to put up like an interview that they're doing at the time? And you're like seeing the manager or the coach or some player, and I'm like, I don't need to see them. I need to see the game. And what drove me nuts about yesterday's baseball game was they shrunk the game. They've got the manager of the Orioles right there, which was, he, I mean, he just clearly didn't want to do the interview. And he's standing there. And then on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, they have this big logo for Fox. And I'm like, I know who I'm watching. I don't need all this. Just show me the game. I can hear him. And so I told Kim, told my wife, I was like, honey, if I had three wishes, you know what I would do with it? And she's like, what? I was like, well, one of my wishes I would use and I would have this never happen again. And she looked at me, she was like, honey, would you please not waste a wish on something so stupid? And I was like, I don't have to listen to you. I'm gonna wish for what I wanna wish. It's my genie, darn it. We think when we get a hold of power, we would be smarter about it. We'd be wiser about it. We'd be more careful about it. But here's the problem. The sin that dwells in the heart of the wealthy, powerful, influential, political giants, whatever it is, pick your, pick your stereotype villain. That sin that dwells in their heart dwells in my heart too. And it dwells in your heart as well. And you might be right about one thing. You might say that your sin doesn't manifest itself in some of the same ways that theirs does, but let's be honest. How do you abuse the power and the influence and the wealth that you have now? How do you abuse that now? That is the same proportion to which you will abuse it if you were to have more. You say, oh, I would, I would, I would never lie like they lie and try and get away with it. Let me ask you this. Do you tell your spouse about those Starbucks coffees you've been buying? You're just like, mm, no, this is cash. They'll never find it. <laughs> I did that with Chick-fil-A on Thursday. Thank you very much. And my wife caught me. You think, oh, I'd never, I'd never cheat on my spouse. Have you ever looked lustfully at somebody else? Given the right opportunity, given the right uh, possibility of never getting caught, given the knowledge that somebody might be interested in you, you might. We have this tendency to exaggerate our own righteousness. I think we're better than we are. And we do it when we compare ourselves to other people because they're like, oh, they don't deserve that, but I do. I do deserve that. Dostoevsky, and if you've listened to me long enough, you know I love a good Dostoevsky quote. He says, I exaggerate everything. That is where I go wrong. One of the things we have to ask ourselves is proportion. We have to ask ourselves a question of proportion. How do we use our power? How do we use our wealth? How do we use what we have? That deeper problem, it exaggerates my own righteousness. We have, to, we have to be aware that that is one of the things that comparison can do to us. It can exaggerate our goodness and other people's unworthiness. But it's not just that. It's not just that comparison exaggerates. It has an opposite effect as well. It also diminishes. Comparison diminishes. Look at verse 13. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long, I've been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. You know what Asaph is doing? He's sitting there saying, you know what? I think I've backed the wrong horse. Because all the things, all the ways that I've exaggerated these, these other people, they seem like gods. And it seems like my God is not capable of handling them of fixing it, of right-sizing it. And so Asaph thinks, I've, I've, I've wasted my life following this God. I've wasted my life investing in this. How is it fair that in the game that is life, I chose to follow God, they chose to not follow God, and we've wound up not in the same place. 
They've wound up ahead. And in verse 16, he says, he essentially says, you know what? I've sunk so much into this. I'm not gonna think about this even anymore. My faith is so not worth the time anymore to even reconcile this conundrum that I'm just gonna go on with life. This is what he says in verse 15. I'm not gonna open my mouth. I'm not gonna complain. I'm not gonna disavow the faith. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep going through the motions. I'm gonna keep showing up to work. I'm gonna keep showing up to church. I'm gonna keep showing up. And I'm gonna look like the good, righteous guy that I've always been, but inside, I'm just a shell. His faith is depreciating before his very eyes. It's wasting away. In comparison, is doing this to him. Because he's looking at the ways of other people, the ways that their gods work, and he's looking at the ways his God works, and he's thinking, it's not enough. It doesn't add up. It doesn't match up. When you were a kid and your parents gave you 25 cents, that's a big coin, right? You were like, man, I got a quarter. That's awesome. And then you find out that a quarter really can't buy you very much anymore. And then you find out annoyingly that four of those big shiny coins can't buy you much either. And that's the point in your life when you discovered inflation. Congratulations. You see, what happens is, what comparison does is it diminishes the gifts that God gives us. It diminishes the gift that God gives us. He gives us things we need for life. He gives us things that we, we want even. And we say it's not enough. Anybody see the show Pawn Stars? Nobody admits to this because that would imply that you've been watching the History Channel at like nine o'clock in the morning on a weekday. <laughs> but I'm sure all of you have. In the show, for those of you that haven't seen it, in the show, uh, uh, there's a, a store, it's a pawn shop, fairly, fairly large pawn shop, and, and they follow people who are like, yeah, my grandfather was in World War II, or you know, he got this from his grandfather who was in you know, the Spanish-American War, and we're just really excited about this. And he's like, I'm just gonna see how much this is worth. And so for him, he's like, I think it's probably worth about ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. And they show up to the pawn shop, and they follow them, like investigating this piece and all this stuff. And then they come back, and the guy that owns the pawn shop famously always says something like, Eh, the best I can do is like $100. And the guy who owns the piece is like dumbfounded. He's like, really? Like, this has sentimental value. This is emotional value. This is, this is important. Like, don't you understand this is a piece of history? And the guy's like, yeah, but like, I got to resell this. And so the best I can do is $100. And so God comes to us and he says, I've given you life. I have given you breath. I have given you uh, uh, clothing. I've given you shelter. I've given you food. I've given you water. I've given you a job. I've given you all this stuff. And our response back to God is, yeah. Best I can do is like two Sundays a month. If you throw in an attractive spouse, I might work in a connect group there. <laughs> Fairly normal children, we'll pray before dinners. Best off. And we think God's like grateful. He's like, oh man, thanks guys. Look, man, Puritans were like every Sunday and that was just way too much, but you guys... You've got it figured out. It's comparison. It diminishes the gifts. And because it diminishes the gifts, it diminishes the giver. And that's the problem. That's the problem with comparison, is that it diminishes the one from whom the gifts come. My dad used to uh, uh, work super early in the morning, and so he would go to bed really early. Uh, and he would get his uniform ready for work at night, and he would buy drinks from the vending machine at work. So he would save his quarters, his nickels, and his dimes, because that's about all that nickels and dimes and quarters can get you, is soft drinks, which, praise the Lord, right? But his pennies were pretty much worthless to him, but somehow he would always have some pennies, and so every once in a while, my dad, I would be watching him get ready or whatever, and my dad would be like, here, do you want the pennies? And he would go through his change, and he would get up all of his pennies, and he would give them to me, and I'd go put them on my piggy bank. And eventually I would roll them up and, and I would take them to the bank and I'd get cash and I'd go buy some toy with them. And you know what? Pennies aren't that valuable. Super not valuable. I mean, how many conversations have people had about just getting rid of pennies, right? But what I have, which is more valuable than a penny, or even the, the things that I bought with the pennies, 
I don't even know what they were, is I have a memory of my dad, who even though he was tired, even though he was trying to go to bed, even though he had to get up early in the morning to go to work, even though that was money that he earned, he still took time to give me that, to bless me with it, be a good dad. And what if I had said, dad, these are just pennies, like, who cares? That wouldn't just diminish the value of the pennies. It would diminish my dad as my father. How disrespectful. And that's what we do to God. It diminishes the giver. But there's another kind of diminishment that takes place, and it's real subtle. You don't see it as much. You're not as aware of it as much. Let's say that. Because we compare, we have this tendency to diminish the value of people who are not believers. We have this tendency, and I don't know if it's a misplaced understanding of like depravity. So we're like, oh, because they're sinners and they're not redeemed, they can't, they can't contribute anything. I don't know if that's the issue. Or if it's like some kind of weird tribalism that we have. So we're like, oh, we're, we're Baptists. And so we don't value anything that non-Baptists, you know, I don't know what it is. I really don't know where it comes from. But it's largely comparison. And so it affects us in all sorts of ways, right? We, we try not to hang out with people who aren't believers, We don't want them to bring us down, right? That's the wording we use. We tend to hire people that have like a Jesus fish on the back of their vehicle because we just assume that they love Jesus. They might. They also might just understand that there are people that will hire them just because they have a Jesus fish on the back of their car. We think even though the highly rated person who's an atheist doesn't do his good work. We have this tendency to diminish the contributions. And what this happens is, what, 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 what happens when we do this is that you diminish God's gift because every human being, and this is what makes what happened in Allen the, the, such a deep tragedy, is that every human being is made in the image of God, whether they are redeemed or not. And that means they have value and they have worth. That is a core Christian belief. So when we compare and we diminish the gift and we diminish the giver, we also have a tendency to diminish other recipients of the gift that we think aren't worthy to have it. And it's something that we have got to stop. We've got to stop it. So we've covered a lot of ground here. And one of the things that I hope you realize and we haven't touched on is that comparison's pretty natural. That's why I started talking about normal. Like we, we tend to compare to figure out what we're supposed to do, Right? Even driving is an act of comparison. If I'm going to change lanes, I have to compare. Is there a car over there? If there is, they better get out of the way. Because this is Dallas. We have places to go. No, I I, I want to drive safely. We compare. We, we, We generally try to orient ourselves based on where I'm supposed to be in life, right? So comparison isn't necessarily bad. It's bad when it runs free reign. That's when it exaggerates and when it diminishes. But what can comparison do for us positively? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about how comparison can catapult us into right ways spiritually. Look what happens in verse 17. So he says, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went to the sanctuary of God and then I discerned this therein. All of a sudden, he gets perspective. He goes back into worship and he's just going to mail it in, but he gets around the people of God. He starts doing his work and he's like, oh my gosh, I get it now. I understand what's going to happen to the wicked. I understand that they are in a more precarious position. He's gained the thing that he didn't have. Somehow God in his grace has taken Asaph from way down here and taken him in his hand and gone, get up there and you're going to see things rightly, see things from my perspective. And so what I want us to do is I want us to look at the different verses at the end of this and see the things that Asaph gets catapulted into. And when you start comparing yourself to other people, when you're like, man, I really want what they have or man, they're really doing better than me. I want you to look for ways for that comparison to catapult you into some of these other ideas, okay? First, it catapults us into pity. Look what happens in verse 18. But when I, sorry, truly you set them in slippery places, you make them fall to ruin, how they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one wakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. Asaph has discerned, it says it in verse 17, he's discerned their end. 
He's figured out what happens actually to people who don't have a relationship with God. All they have to trust in, all they have to hope in is their wealth, their power, their influence. And once that's over, once their life is over, that's all they have. And so what they've derived from Asaph is pity. He compares himself to them and he's like, I have something so much more secure than what they have. And so when you notice yourself comparing yourself to other people, maybe look for ways, and again, I know pity is not a welcome term in our society. I know some of you, if you're like, man, don't pity me. I don't want your pity, pastor. You can keep that. And I hope you understand where that comes from. Because as I said, I believe you are made in the image of God, which means that you were created for your creator and that you will never know the fulfilled life that God wants you to have until you orient yourself to what God desires for you. You were made for him. Therefore, he gets to say what you do with your life. And it makes me so incredibly sad when I see people who are so either gifted or talented or, you know what? Just really sweet people, normal people, miss out on this great gift of following God. So you have my pity. And I hope you take that for the, the loving thing that it's supposed to be, because it is. At the same time, it can catapult us into confession. Look what happens in verse 21. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you, which if you're looking for something to spice up your prayer life, verse 22 is not a bad choice. Going to God and being like, I was brutish before you. Or when you say you're sorry to somebody, hey, I was sorry, I was brutish. Okay, that one didn't land. But you know what? It's not a bad idea. What's interesting is Asaph is confessing, but it's a confession that's really uh, unique. He's not necessarily confessing sin. I hope you, you see that. He's confessing a wrong perspective. I don't think God gets upset when we say, God, this isn't fair. God, this doesn't seem right. God, look at the way the world is. I don't think he gets upset about that. So I think what Asaph is doing is he's realizing, man, I've got this new perspective and now it's making sense and God, I realize I was wrong. Job, Job, in all he did, never sinned. In all the whole course of the, the things that were happening in his life, he didn't sin. Doesn't mean he was perfect. It just means in that instance, he didn't call God into question as much. And at the end, you know what he says? He's like, I spoke about what I didn't know. I was wrong, God. I didn't understand. When you notice yourself comparing to other people, finding ways to confess, be like, mm, okay, God, show me what I'm not seeing here because I know I'm not seeing something. You're wiser than I am. You're smarter than I am. Why do they have what they have? Or why is that happening in their life? Open my eyes and then confess. Oh, I see how it's wrong. It's confession. And then what happens is after you get confessed, after you get catapulted into confession, you then get catapulted into praise. Look at verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. This is how you know when your confession has been heard. When you've really confessed from the heart, you move into praise. You want to worship the Lord. You don't feel like there's this distance, this estrangement between you. You're continually with him. This is essentially an act of comparison that Asaph is doing. He's looking at what everybody else has and he looks at what he has and he says, I have God and he is in heaven and I'll always have him and that's enough for me. So when you notice yourself comparing to other people, why don't I have this or how come this is working out for them? Find reasons to praise. Find reasons to worship him. Lastly, it catapults us into hope. Verse 26 my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you, but for me it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. Comparison propels us into hope, a hope of a future with God. God's our strength, our refuge, our safe place. And we need that, especially in days like these. But can I be honest about something? God's not always my refuge. Or maybe the way I should put this is God's not always my first refuge. 
Food winds up being a nice refuge. Baseball winds up being a nice refuge. Knowing I have enough money in the bank to pay bills, that's a nice refuge. God rarely is the top of that list. And so I read this, and I think to myself, I'm like, wow. I don't know that I can say this all the time. And then I read verse 27. Those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. And I read that, and I'm like, I'm unfaithful to God a lot. Probably a lot more than people in this room might think. Am I cut off? We've been reading through the Psalms in our dwell readings. We're reading, you know, just chapters of, of Scripture each day. And we're in the Psalms right now. And one of the things I've been doing on this read-through is rather than reading the Psalms, it's so easy to read the Psalms, right, and be like, oh, this is how I feel. This is speaking, like, what, I, what my heart is. I've been trying to do something different. And maybe it's what I should have been doing all along, is I've been reading it as if Jesus was singing it. Like, where in Jesus' life is Jesus able to say these things? Or where, where might this have been coming from his heart? And usually I wind up on the cross. It's usually where I land, and this is no different. I see the end of verse 73, and I see him singing, maybe in his mind, but for me it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. That's all Jesus had left. If you compare Jesus with everybody else, he was naked, he was bleeding, he was hurting, he was dying. I can't sing this. But notice what it says. He says, it's to tell of all your works. Jesus dies so that he can tell us. He comes back to life so he can tell us that we now have hope in him. We have a future in him. The song of the faithful now becomes the song of us because we get counted as the faithful. We get counted now with Jesus' righteousness if we put our faith and trust in him. And so when you find yourself comparing yourself to other people, the drive that you can land on is, you know what, though? I have hope in Christ. And one day, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And one day, there will be a place for me with him and with those who follow him. And so what happens is comparison can lead you to hope. Hope of a world where people aren't so crushed by comparison. Hope of a world where you're not so crushed by comparison. And you can praise, and you can confess, and you can pity. But first, when you compare yourself to Christ, you're not going to stack up. That's why you can't compare yourself to him. You must submit to him and give him your life. And I hope that you'll do that today. Comparison has a nasty habit of exaggerating things or diminishing things. But from God's perspective, when we begin to look around and see where we're at in relation to other people, it really can launch us into some amazing things if we let it, if we get into a habit and a discipline of doing so. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the wisdom that it provides. But thank you more than anything else for showing us who you are. A God who, even though we obsess over comparison and we obsess over what other people have and we diminish you and we diminish your gifts to us, God, you still are patient with us and you love us. And so, God, I pray that you would continue to be patient. I pray that you would open our eyes to see the great gift that you are. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.